I'm Rick Edelman, and this is The Truth About Money. On today's show... See, they get you coming and going. And you're saying to yourself, what if I die? The answer is, what do you care? The way to broach the subject is um, to blame me. When we first uh, built AOL, it was illegal to get online. That's all coming up right here, right now, on The Truth About Money. Here's a puzzler for you. John and Kathy want to buy a four-bedroom colonial. There's a bathroom in the master suite. Two bedrooms upstairs share another bathroom, and there's a powder room in the hallway on the main level. Downstairs in the finished basement is another full bathroom. So, I have a simple question for you. How many bathrooms are in this house? We asked a lot of people this question, and here are their answers. Four, two, one, two, three, five. Powder room, when you say powder room, does that mean a, a commode as well? Three and a half. Three, plus the powder room. I don't know if you consider a powder room a bathroom. I'm not sure what a powder room is. <laughs> three and a half baths. I mean, three and a half? In this city, they count, they count it at a bathroom as a room. <laughs> That's strange. See, see, they get you coming and going. So how many bathrooms are in this house? According to the bank's appraisal, the correct answer is two and a half. Did you get that answer right? I'll bet you didn't. I'll bet you said three and a half. Well, I don't blame you. That makes perfect sense, unless you're a bank. You see, when reviewing a property, bank appraisers only include the above grade features. The basement is below grade, so neither the bedroom or the bathroom down there are included in the count. The good news, though, is that the appraisal form does have a section for basements, and the bedroom and bathroom can be listed there. But unfortunately, they won't be given the same value as an above-ground room. Here's another question for you. Who owns John and Kathy's appraisal? That seems like another no-brainer. John and Kathy paid for the appraisal, so they should own it, right? Well, they don't. It belongs to the bank. And that's because the bank ordered the report. No other lender can use that appraisal unless the bank agrees to allow it. And they won't unless they charge John and Kathy a couple of hundred bucks. Well, what happens if John and Kathy simply order their own appraisal so that they do own it themselves? Well, nice try, but lenders won't accept an appraisal that they didn't order. If John and Kathy decide to go with another lender, they'll have to buy another appraisal. The moral of the story? The mortgage industry doesn't always see the world the way you and I do. So when you're buying a house or refinancing a loan, don't be surprised by the unexpected. If you see or hear something that doesn't look right, ask your loan officer. Chances are there's a simple explanation. And should you discover a real mistake, bringing it to your mortgage company's attention will allow them to help you get it fixed pretty quick. When I do Q&A with my live seminars, you never know what the audience is going to ask. Let's take a listen. My wife and I have been married for less than a year now, and we're interested, we're looking forward to uh, trying to start a family, have at least two kids. So the question that I have for you is, if we were to set a financial goal for what amount to save before starting to try to have a family, what would that goal be? Do both of you and your wife currently work? Yes. Are you assuming that once you have the kids, one of you will become a stay-at-home parent? Uh, for some time, yes. Okay. Then here's what you need to do. You need to act today as though one of you is already that stay-at-home parent. What, a lot, what traps an awful lot of young parents is that you've got all the, the anticipation and excitement of having kids, and you know they're coming. One thing that is never a surprise is the delivery of a baby. So there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm, and you begin to notice how costs are beginning to grow because of all the clothes that the expectant mom needs, plus all the clothes the baby's going to need, and all the stuff that goes along with having kids. You know the drill very well. And they always say, well, we're going to have to tighten up after the baby comes because that's when mom, usually mom, is going to stay home with the baby for at least a couple of months and in many cases a couple of years and sometimes permanently. Forget it. Instead, act like that has occurred already. 
if you're assuming that your wife is going to stay home after she delivers and therefore loses her paycheck, I want you to pretend that she's lost her paycheck already. Take her paycheck right now and throw 100% of it into savings. Act like it doesn't exist, because after the baby's born, it won't. And if you can't afford to do that now, what on earth makes you think you're going to be able to afford to do that after the baby has arrived? So act now while you still have the flexibility of saying, oh my goodness, thank, thank God that check is still coming so that we can use it if we have to. Because it gets really dynamic. Right now, you got two people living in the house with two incomes, and all of a sudden, your income goes down by 50%, and the number of people in the house go up by 50%. That's a bad economic combination. Of course, I'm not going to suggest that you alter your plans. But I will suggest that you alter your finances by acting like you've only got one income right now. OK, so how many a year? How, how long would you say? How many months income should we have saved of, uh, or how many months of spending, of our typical spending, would you recommend uh, having stowed away before we start that? You should have at least 12 months worth of spending in a cash reserves account, a rainy day fund, so that if one of you loses an income, or if heaven forbid you both do, or you incur a major expense, medical, or something wrong with the house, or who knows what, you've got a big bucket of money that you can tap into to tide yourself over so that you can pay bills for a long time while you're getting out of that dilemma, whatever it happens to be. So you should build that cash reserves, and if you act now that that second income is gone, you can use that to building those reserves right away. And don't allow finances to stop you from having children. Because if you take that attitude, everyone would get a dog. <laughs> we already have a dog. <laughs> Alrighty then. <laughs> because I'm going to retire in two years and six months, and my house is paid for, I have friends who say, why don't you do another loan on the house? And I'm saying, 10 years, 15 years, that's going to be paying a note well into my 70s or 80s. Does that make sense? So the notion of taking your house that's currently fully paid for and pulling out, say, $100,000 out of that house, giving you a mortgage of maybe $700 a month, you're saying, why would I want to have a mortgage of $700 a month when I don't have that mortgage payment now? It's simple. For that $700 a month, you get hundred grand in your hip pocket. Could that hundred grand be of value to you in supporting your lifestyle, in improving and enhancing the lifestyle, in compensating should you have a major crisis financially or health-wise, having that money available to you, that could prove to be really darn good. Because if you take the 100 grand out of the mortgage and you now owe the bank $700 a month, you give them the $700 out of the 100 grand. You now have 99,300 left. Even if you never invest the money, it'll last 15 years. And if you do invest the money, do you suppose you might be able to invest it over the next 30 years for a rate of return more than what the loan itself is costing? Now, all of a sudden, you're profiting from the whole strategy, plus you've improved your liquidity along the way. Your friends might be on to something. <laughs> Here's the interesting part. You're saying to yourself, wait a minute. I'm, let me, let me ask how- I'll be 63 next month. You're 63 years old, and I'm telling you to go get a 30-year loan. And I'm telling you to get a $100,000 30-year loan. I'm telling you to have a mortgage until you're 93 years old. And you're saying to yourself, what if I die? And the answer is, what do you care? <laughs> okay. Here's our financial quiz of the day, testing your financial literacy. You're going to have to hang around to get the answer. Pretty clever of us, huh? Which should you do first? Contribute to your retirement plan at work or pay off credit cards? Stay tuned for the answer. Every week I do a live radio show along with my colleagues Brandon Corso and Anderson Wozni taking questions live on the air. Here's what's been on people's minds just a little while ago. I have a question. I've been asked by my sister to help her to come up with um, a case to present to my parents um, so that they will help her 
buy an apartment for for her and her two children. She's divorced. Her money situation uh, could be a bit better. Even though my parents have seen other older couples um, giving college money to their children or down payments for houses and things like that, they've just never shown any interest in doing that. Um, You sound a little exasperated, Elizabeth. Are you not a fond of this idea? I just, I'm rather, I'm frightened to uh, to do it. I don't want to cause bad blood or put people on the spot. Okay. You know Where I mean? is your sister living now? In Florida. I mean, in an apartment? In a. She is in a rental townhouse. Okay. And she's working? Yes. Okay. Your parents, are you familiar with their financial situation? Yes. It's a good one? Yes. They could, they could afford to help your sister out this way? Oh, yes. Okay. Definitely. And is it just you and your sister? Mm-hmm. And how are relations among the three of you? Well, they're good as far as I can tell. Okay. I mean, I, I wish they would I mean, you're I a close family. would help her. But you're, you're a close family. Um, I guess we are, except okay. uh, where are your money parents, comes in. Elizabeth, are your parents familiar with your sister's financial situation? Yes. Okay. Uh, is it your int- parents' intention, do you know, to leave their assets when they pass to you and your sister? Yes. Okay. The way to broach the subject is mm-hmm. um, to blame me, is for your sister and you, the next time all of you are together, mm-hmm. don't do this over the phone, <laughs> and certainly not in an email, <laughs> no, no, no. the next time you're all together, uh, mm-hmm. your sister should... Tell your parents, with you present, that she talked with a financial advisor Mm -hmm. about her financial situation. Mm -hmm. And her financial advisor, me, Mm -hmm. told her to talk to her parents about getting an advance on her inheritance. Oh, brilliant. Okay. And and this way, she can blame me. I become the fall guy. Acknowledging mm-hmm. that your parents are likely to live another 20, 30 years or more, and mm-hmm. your sister and you don't need the inheritance at that time, mm-hmm. you could really use it now for the benefit of her children who need mm-hmm. a stable home environment where they're in a neighborhood of better schools mm-hmm. and better safety and blah, 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 blah. Oh, excellent. So take that approach. And you might even talk with your sister about making the story true by mm-hmm. having her really go talk with a financial advisor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's a very good idea. The answer is A. Contribute to your retirement plan at work. If you don't start saving for retirement until after you pay off your debts, you'll reach retirement with nothing saved. Recently, I had a conversation with Ted Leonsis one of the early leaders of AOL, and now the majority owner of Monumental Entertainment, the company that owns the Washington Capitals hockey team, basketball's Washington Wizards, and the Washington Mystics of the WNBA. Ted is an active entrepreneur who has provided funding for a number of successful startups. He's also an enthusiastic philanthropist who has written several books, including The Business of Happiness, Six Secrets to Extraordinary Success in Work and Life. The interview took place in Ted's office at the Verizon Center, home of the Caps, the Wizards, and the Mystics. Ted, clearly you began as a techie. Uh, First big entrepreneurial effort, America Online, now AOL. Uh, Before you moved over to other aspects of entrepreneurship, is one a prerequisite for the other? Well, I think uh, we are living in a Facebook, Internet, Google age, and... um, uh, Internet has become like running water and electricity. It powers just about every business. Internet-related or any vertical, you'll, all roads will come back to the Internet. So uh, being smart in math, being smart in understanding application of technology seems to be a prerequisite now for any business you can enter. Did it occur to you back in the 80s when you were immersed in what America Online was doing, now AOL, did you anticipate it was going to get as big as it got? Um, as an entrepreneur, you always think these things are going to get really big, really fast. And we were blessed and that it got even bigger and grew even faster than we thought. And everyone thought that 
Steve Case, a little less, me, were really smart by going after the consumer space. And they thought we had a, a plan and we knew where the business and the consumer market were going. And to be honest, it had nothing to do with that. It was we didn't have any money to build our own network. And Sprint had a daytime business network and it wasn't being used at night. So we met the guys from Sprint and they licensed us their unused capacity, which was at night. So if you had a network available at night, you had to be a consumer service. And that wasn't something anybody really gave any thought of. It was just exploiting an opportunity that happened to exist. Yeah, I think part of the entrepreneurial uh, ethos is to peer around some corners and see where the world might end up in a year or two years. And having vision and strategy is good. Um, I think a great philosopher once said execution uh, vision without execution is hallucination, and I think that's that's really true. The best businesses are created with a big idea and innovation, but just the relentlessness to try and market and and build and create a service that's great for every part of the value chain. Now, given the choice, if you could start over at a time of your choosing to get involved in entrepreneurship and business development and creativity, would you choose to do it when you did it back in the 80s with AOL, or would you choose to start today from scratch? Where well, was it I, easier to be, To where are the opportunities? Was it easier to be an entrepreneur then than it is today? Well, you have to remember when we first uh, built AOL, it was illegal to get online. To connect a private enterprise to a public network was against the law, and uh, computers didn't have modems in it. I mean, I remember going down uh, IBM and Boca Raton and, frankly, begging the people that I knew that down there to start to embed within their computers modems so that you could get online. And when I first got online, I got online at 1,200 baud. Boy, when it got to 2,400 baud, you could begin to see a picture start to load up. And, and the great thing about all these businesses, they've all ridden along Moore's Law. And that's the fundamental drive of everything. Moore's Law being happened. that technology is doubling. At uh, half the price every 18 months. And so if you hooked a business on early to that, uh, you tended to be able to attack a traditional business that was more involved in the physical, and lots of fortunes were made with these young companies. So that would suggest that you believe that today the opportunities are even greater than they were 20 years ago. You don't have to overcome such fundamentals as a modem and a PC. Well, when I first got online, there was probably less than a million people online around the world. Today, there's 2.2 billion people online. So, uh, But probably at the time, there weren't 100 people that could spell internet. Now everyone is an internet entrepreneur and there's lots of venture capital available right now. A lot of Me Too businesses. Back then you had to be an evangelist and I used to say we were beggars because you'd have to explain to someone what this new phenomenon and the magic of getting online was and now it's become part of your everyday life. After people become very successful financially in, in their businesses, it often allows them a chance to step back and, and take a bigger look at life and uh, goals and objectives and, and happiness. And one of the books you've written is called The Business of Happiness. Talk about that. Well, you know, I was a poor kid growing up. I'm an only child. My mom and dad didn't go to college. And kind of as an ethnic young man, education was placed front and center. And the expectation was that my generation would do better than the previous generation and that education was the way to do it and I think the formula that me and a whole generation were taught was that if you worked real hard and you did good in school you'd get good grades if you got good grades you'd get a good job if you got a good job you'd make a lot of money if you made a lot of money you'd be six successful and if you were successful you'd be happy and it was a chronological step by step i think it was and then you retire at 65 and move to Boca Raton and i i think what we're all seeing is that that promise but also that concept probably doesn't fit most people and what my book basically tackled was I know a lot of successful people who are incredibly unhappy and unfulfilled. Yet most people who I meet who are very, very happy and self-actualized, they become successful. And 
you know, if you go to the Library of Congress and you see all of the edits to the Declaration of Independence, you know, our founding fathers were smart people. They were, this was a startup. And they said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Never before it, had a nation been founded on happiness. And it's a remarkable concept that no teacher, no professor, frankly, not even my mom and dad ever said to me, but are you happy? Um, and so what I believe that this generation who lives its life online, whose perhaps expectation isn't to do quote unquote better than their parents, they are looking for self-actualization. And companies that focus on the tenets of happiness, they tend to do better. Um, it's the most successful private company in the world right now. Facebook. What's Facebook all about? Communities of interest. I mean, we had AOL, which you could argue led to Facebook, if not directly, indirectly. Uh, who would have ever thought of it? And along the way, you had other iterations. Is Facebook it, or will something come along that displaces Facebook? Oh, I'm sure that there's some nine-year-old <laughs> in some garage who's tinkering with something that'll displace all of them. I mean, the Roman Empire lasted a couple of hundred years and it fell. And, and I think that this creative destruction is what this industry is about. I mean, there's been some companies that show longevity of excellence on Intel, Google, Microsoft, Cisco. I think Facebook has the opportunity, uh, Apple computer, you know, there'll be 10 bellwether companies, bellwether stocks that span multiple generations, provide great services, but that doesn't mean they're not vulnerable. AOL had 36 million subscribers, and you know now I think they're down to 3 million subscribers. The technology changed, the business models changed, and, and nothing is given to you. You have to earn everything in this new world. A lot of people watching this are no doubt going to be excited and enthused about the technological elements of our conversation here, but most are not techies themselves, nor entrepreneurial minded. What messages should they be drawing from our conversation? Well, I think one, people should focus on being happy and being active in their communities of interest and tuning up their empathy and, and having high levels of self-expression and be in pursuit of a higher calling. In terms of technology, I can't really think of one aspect of our day-to-day -day life. Uh, we used to type a letter and l put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and bring it down to the post office. And when you think about it, it's pretty barbaric, right? It would take three or four days. And now we send emails. And now we don't even have to send emails. We can do a, a tweet or we can do a text. And so the... The pace of change has been dramatic, and so I would say that we should be embracing um, this new world, this new technology. It'll just get faster, cheaper, until it's free across the board, and I would say that it's like oxygen. You better get used to it. Ted, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Before we go, are you angry over who's in the White House or in control of Congress? Watch out, because that could cost you. A recent study found that people of both political parties are more optimistic about investing when their own party is in power, and they're more cautious when the other guys are in office. Professors from the University of Texas found that investors earn about 2.7% more per year when their guy's in charge, because they invest with more optimism. But this affects both Democrats and Republicans equally, suggesting that you shouldn't ever change your investments merely because the political winds have shifted. Don't let politics color your investment decisions. Remember, investing is not about red or blue. It's about green. And that's the truth about money. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks for watching.